France's Provence transforms into an inferno. Houses, pine forests, hills, seaside, no one is safe. We haven't had a real fire season in years, but this one could become very bad. The neighborhood is being evacuated. Down that road? No, there's no evacuation that way. They lit a counter fire against, meaning a fire that goes towards the wildfire, meets it and stops it. Tell them to send more. In total, 12,000 acres go up in smoke in a summer that sets the record for the number of fires. A daily challenge for the firefighters. Three months of battling the flames. The opportunity to put into practice years of training. They know that some in their ranks may be injured. I was scared when I found myself on the ground. With 6,000 firefighters and 1,500 vehicles, the Bouche de Rhone department is one of the best equipped in France. I stabilize. I want to roll it back. I stabilize. On land, in the air, or on the water, they observe and stand ready to intervene. Go on! For the soldiers of fire, this season will long be remembered. You will witness their daily lives, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, battling the flames. The department of the Bouche de Rhone has experienced the worst fire season in decades. More than 9,000 acres went up in smoke. Caused by an exceptional drought and the presence of an arsonist, the fires were each time fanned by episodes of dry, gusty winds, the Mistral. After three months of grueling fights, the firefighters are literally exhausted. The firefighters and their equipment are waiting for only one thing, the rain. It alone can end the threat of forest fires. But in early September, the weather forecast is not for rain. It's for strong winds. The Mistral will strike again. This exceptional fire season, is it really over? September the 5th, 5.40 p.m. The Bouche de Rhone Firefighting Operations Center has just received a fire alert. Teenagers playing with a lighter have started a fire in the southern districts of Marseille in the township of Lumigny. Fanned by an extraordinary mistral, the fire spreads towards the Calanque Massif. This is it, the fire starting. Hey, he was asking for a fire, here it is. From their preventive alert position at the exit of the town of Aubagne, Lieutenant Robert Mugelli and his team received the order to intervene. Mill 13,000 Aubagne Codis, come in. Mill 13,000 Aubagne Codis here. New site for you on Genest Road. Roger that, Codis. We can see the smoke rising from the Etoile Bridge. His group consists of a scout SUV and two heavy cannon trucks carrying 3,500 gallons. They're mastodons in the fight against forest fires. They are sent urgently towards the Calanque Massive, from which a huge column of smoke is rising. It's coming from the Col de la Geneste, which the fire managed to reach in just a few minutes. The Mistral rapidly pushes the flames towards the east and southeast. Arriving 10 minutes after the start of the fire, the water bombers are already at work. The Canadairs and trackers drop load after load. They're supported by the largest aircraft in the fleet, the Dash 8, which carries 10 tons of fire retardant. 
Above them, perched at 10,000 feet, is Horus, the Aerial Surveillance Operations Center. It takes position. Thanks to its three gyro-stabilized cameras and advanced GPS positioning tools, it sends valuable information on the progress of the fire to the ground command center. The first planes arrived 10 minutes after the start of the flames. These first minutes have allowed the fire to develop with phenomenal power. All of these air operations try as best they can to contain the fire in the valley of Geneste. Because the wind is pushing the fire towards a parallel valley to the north, at the end of which is the strategic Carpiagna military base. If the fire overflows to the north and follows the valley, the military camp will be in its path. For now, defending the base is the top priority. 40 minutes after the start of the fire, Robert Mugelli and his team arrive at the bottom of the Col de la Geneste. They know they must prepare for the worst. With their fire gear donned, they start off toward the source of the smoke. The further they advance, driving up this small road, the more the fire looks gigantic. There it is. It's a disaster, Robert. We can see it from the Etoile Bridge. The area is already cleared. Public access is prohibited. The access to the Kalonk is blocked. He's asking me if they can go there. No, don't go there. It'd be dangerous. Robert Mugelli and his men are told to wait. There's no point in running toward the fire. It's more efficient to fit into the overall strategy implemented by the head of operations. But waiting is a real test, as the desire to do battle against the fire is great. Finally, they get their orders. 743? No, you're on 612. The chief of operations chooses to send Lieutenant Mugelli's group to the fire's left flank along the Gineste route. Secure your cabins just in case, then we'll see what we'll do. The goal is to stop the flames' progression before they can reach the valley of Carpiani and the military base. We're coming up, bringing water. All personnel listening on 612, the goal is to locate the left flank. As soon as we can park, we'll take out the hoses. We're stopping. Captain Denis Barges returns from the fire's front line. His analysis on the point of attack will be invaluable. We stay on the road. Stay on the road with your hoses to help Regis, who's working from the road to the ridge. So I join up with Regis, OK? Join Regis. OK, park on the left. From the side of the road, the trucks are positioned downhill of a wall of flames. The water cannons begin to attack the furnace. But part of the fire travels out of the water cannon's range. The team must leave the safety of their trucks to unroll hoses in the scrubland. The smoke is so thick and the wind so turbulent that the men are immediately in danger. Due to the extreme heat, Plant essences emit gas plumes that ignite. Faced with these fireballs, the slightest error can be deadly. Hey, it's over there! Open the valve! Watch out, Alex. Move back a little. I need some help here! It's not connected. Hurry up! Okay, we're good. The attack works, but a tongue of flames passes north of the group. They have to add more lengths of hose and go even further from the safety of their tank trucks. Open it! Despite all the hose lengths, the fire manages to escape to the north. We deployed all the hose we had from the 13045, and we still have 75% of our water reserves. Copy that. They have to face facts. Though Robert's men managed to weaken the fire here, it's now traveling elsewhere. Go ahead. 
We're on the side burning against the wind. It's jumped and divided, and the planes are over there. Their action in this sector is coming to a close. So what do we do, Robert? What's your plan? Catch it low down. On the team, everyone knows the fire is progressing. It's moving very fast. We'll try to catch it on the lower left flank. The fire escapes towards the valley of Carpiana, and the odds of stopping it before it reaches the military base are decreasing. The adrenaline of the action gradually gives way to bitterness. It was too far from the nozzles. We couldn't reach it. I know. It's OK, we tried. With this fire engine, we can't reach the path because it's too difficult. Our nozzles only reached 43 yards. The fire got away from us because it was too far away. That's why we're upset. But at least we started to attack it, even with our heavy fire engine. The only solution, stow their hoses quickly and find a better access point further downhill. Because in this dense brush, getting access to the flames is the key. In the Ginest Massif, there's no good access. There is access by the Calanque, but not through the Massif toward the Carpian camp. Meanwhile, several acres of scrubland disappear. The wind picks up intensity, and now, in addition to the Carpiania military base, the entire Calanque mountain coastline is in the fire's path. Calanque National Park is threatened. It's one of the department's most prestigious areas, the ultimate postcard of the Bouche de Rhone, a dozen breathtakingly beautiful limestone fjords, which welcome two million visitors each year. In the fire's path at the end of the Calanque Mountains is the town of Cassis. In the marina of Port Mieu. And on the peninsula, hundreds of yachts, villas and buildings huddle in the pine forest that's already in danger. On the road of Genest, the situation has deteriorated. The fire spreads like the plague, making huge strides towards the military base. It's just one and a quarter miles away. Robert's heavy truck group must hurry to a new objective. Alex, team up with Lulu. We'll see what we do. Where is he? A little further up the curve. All the officers are looking for a weak spot, an access point that will allow them to make a breakthrough to the north. Hello. Hi. I'm the leader of the left flank sector. I'm checking up on positions. I brought my trucks down so we could try to intervene down here. But I think my cannons are out of range and nothing can get through. If you find an access point... OK, I'll let you know. Left flank leader? Left flank leader 704. From the road, the view of the fire's right flank is also alarming. Damn it, it turned right. It did? Yeah, look, son of a gun. Do we stop here? No, go to the truck and see what we do next. Then what? I'm not sure what we'll do next. Down the road, downstream of the fire, it's the same problem. Dense brush covers the slopes up to the peak. No fire paths, no access. Oh, damn. And the fire continues to spread northward. Drive. Take the left path. We'll see if we can attack it from up there. Then, on the left side of the road, there's an opening. Robert has a hunch. This spot appears to provide them access. Turn around and face the fire. Let's wait a few minutes and see how it develops. At just 1,000 feet from the first buildings at the base, there may be a weak spot to exploit. I'm at the cistern 430. This area presents two advantages, a full cistern and a small trail that heads north. It may allow them to stop the approaching front line of the fire. If they want to save the Carpiania base, this attack zone will be their last chance, but they'll have to act fast. Maybe we can use this spot. It's protected and there's a water reserve. Join me here. Do you copy? Over. I'm not far. I'll be there in five minutes. Robert asks for reinforcements to mount an operation on this site. We got it here! Seconds later, the two attack trucks and the tactical fire team arrive on the scene. 
I'm staying here. Position yourselves on both sides of the communication trucks in the same direction. The tactical fire team is a special squad composed entirely of seasoned firefighters to battle against the flames. The squadron's specialty is igniting counter fires, controlled fires whose goal is to consume the wildfire's fuel in order to stop its progression. At its head, Vincent Pastor and Jean-Jacques Porchier. The tactical fire team is next to me. Maybe we can establish a counter fire. With Robert Mugelli, the two men establish a bold plan of attack that must first be validated by the chief of the sector. There's the tactical fire team. I'm over there with the water reserve. We're lucky. We can use this area to attack the fire. Vincent, come here. What are you going to do with the counter fire? What do you propose? The fire is already fighting against itself. You see, it's going up and then down. We want to set up over there, then return to the path. We'll light the counter fire and the tanker trucks will follow us. We'll go up along the Gineste, burning what's in front of us, stopping the fire there, and then we can save this area. OK, we'll save this area here. Their maneuver is delicate and daring. The idea is to use the topography of this small valley that disrupts the natural flow of the wind. Here, the airflow, which in altitude comes from the west, is extremely disturbed at ground level and tends to go against the prevailing wind. The trick is to ignite the counter fire along the path and let it progress towards the wildfire's approaching front line. The challenge is to control the counter fire, to prevent it from spreading in the direction of the wind and then reinforce the fire. This will be the delicate task of two 3,500-gallon heavy trucks and their powerful water cannons. For information, the 415 are in sight. The other essential weapon in this plan is the Air Force. The Canadairs will focus on the northern edge of the fire. Accurate and efficient drops will help to keep the fire from escaping. On the ground, the men will have to face the monster's head. The counterfire must not be ignited too soon. They must let the beast come as close as possible and, above all, not fall prey to fear. The anxiety is manageable as long as the fire is far off, but it suddenly comes closer. In no time, a huge flaming wall blocks the horizon and advances towards the firefighters. The air becomes unbreathable, the heat unbearable. In the gusts, the smoke is so dense that it eclipses the sun. Positioning the trucks in this furnace becomes extremely complicated. They have to keep cool heads and manage a balance between effectiveness and risk. Laurent, back up. I can't see you. The flame's front line is very close. It's now time to act. Laurent, back up. I'll guide you. The tactical fire team goes on the attack. In a particularly violent gust, Jean-Jacques Pouchier is caught in a wave of burning smoke. He's shaken, but he's unharmed. It's okay, it's okay, I'm all right. It took me by surprise. Their maneuver continues almost blindly. Laurent, Laurent Robert, you can't let the fire go to your right. The counter fire is on your left. It can't go to the right, do you copy? In this tornado of hot ashes and smoke, it's difficult to see if the operation has worked. The atmosphere is rather pessimistic. It's going to reach Carpian. You're right. They start thinking about a plan B if this plan should fail. But in a lull in the wind, the flaming curtain opens and reveals the fire is contained. It didn't jump the path. It didn't jump. It's there, over there. It didn't jump. It's there, look. The counterfire seems to have worked. They must immediately resume the operation to extinguish the last flame. <laughs> the 
they have to work fast because the truck's water reserves are nearly empty. Alex, how much water do you have left? Quarter of a tank. Quarter of a tank, correct? A few minutes later, it's good news. The smoke clears permanently, revealing that the huge flame front they were facing is indeed dead. In front of them spreads a vast expanse of ash and calcined branches. But behind them, the scrubland is green. The fire will not go any further on this flank. The Carpiana base is out of the woods. And though elsewhere the fire is still raging, here the firefighters claim a first victory against the enemy. Yes, it was a success on a small scale success, but we stopped the fire from going up there. If the tanker trucks and the tactical fire unit hadn't intervened, the Carpian camp would have been threatened. It was time their combat stopped. The truck's tanks are empty. The giant cistern filled last spring was a real blessing. This break is an opportunity for them to refresh their bodies and their minds, and for some to realize how close they came to a dangerous accident. With the first nozzle, we couldn't get it. Are we connected? Yeah, it's good. Go ahead. Oh, damn, look there. Yeah, it's igniting there, and also on the other side of the road. Disaster. It's going to reach the Calanque. On the fire's right flank, south of the Genest Road, the fire is still winning. Taking advantage of higher and denser vegetation, the flames devour acres and acres of forest. An invisible lava consumes the landscape. As it advances, the cone of fire expands and gains ground to the south in the direction of the Calanque. The massif of the national park is still under heightened surveillance. A map of fire risk prevention is designed annually, and the firefighters make many proposals. Let's go back four months. It's late May. Vincent Pastor and Philippe Delquier join a group of agents from the National Park Service, the ONF, Marine firefighters, and soldiers from the Carpiana base. The challenge is to come to an agreement on firefighting infrastructure without degrading the landscape. On the ridges overlooking the valleys of the Geneste and Chalombron, they're looking for solutions to stop possible disasters. We can see how the wind is shaking the trees, so the day of the fire, it'll be the same. The fire will jump to the plateau and then to the terraces. Once the fires jump that area, we won't be able to stop it from reaching Cassis. One of the strategies planned at the time was directing fire towards the scree. If you direct it so it comes up towards us, up this ridge, that'll slow it down. Four months later, the valleys they're contemplating, all this vegetation at their feet is about to disappear. Were the measures taken that day sufficient? Or is this fire simply unstoppable? One thing is certain. When on the southern flank, it bounds forward by hundreds of yards at a time, nothing can contain it. Horace's thermal camera allows us to understand what's happening. The wind pushing the fire is a terrible force of contamination. The glowing embers fly through the air and ignite new sources. Firefighters call this phenomena jumps. Due to these jumps, the fire multiplies. In the valley of Chalombron, a new source of fire has just appeared, triggered by a cylinder which traveled more than 500 yards beneath the breeze of the fire's front line. Jumps on the fire's right flank are now contaminating the entire southern sector of the Massif. It jumped. You see that? We can't go there. Let's go, Joe. We're turning around. 
The young firefighter Robin Schmidt has just joined the team. It's his first encounter with a forest fire. See that? It's a jump? Yeah, and we can't reach it. All the forces are now focused on the right flank, speckled with flaming jumps. The aim is now to save the Calanque, and before them, the Logisson farm. This farm, isolated in the valley of Geneste, is directly in the path of the fire. To save it, they must act, and act fast, because soon night will fall, and the Canadairs will return to their base. They must therefore make the most of these last drops. Given the scale of the disaster, Colonel Alion, the supreme chief of all firefighters in the Bouche de Rhone, takes command of the front line. And as the sun sets, concern is growing. I think it's going to jump over us because we won't have the planes as support. We'll do the best we can. To the south, as far as the eye can see, flames. Where and how to act in this patchwork of fires. Turn around! Turn around! One method requires prospecting to forestall new branches and keep the farm from burning. Pass them, pass them. On the heights of the Cholombron Valley, only 300 feet from the farm, a flame front erupts. An ideal target for the heavy trucks and their water cannons. They must be brought quickly. The flames on the left of the truck are barely mastered when a tongue of fire appears on the right flank. The 3,500-gallon truck showed their effectiveness. This road that the fire took towards the farm was closed down just before the first orchards. On the other side of the valley, jumps have attacked new, completely inaccessible groves. Without the Canadairs, nothing can be done other than to watch them burn. The water cannon trucks are useless here, and the vision is apocalyptic. Further north, not far from the farm, an area of scrubland ignites and advances along the road. On this small plateau, the four heavy trucks could save the area. Give us a hand. The fire is about to reach the valley and we can't follow it. Let's go. The chief of operations wants his four giant trucks to make the junction with the road. Only obstacle, there is no path. I can't see a thing. Want me to turn around now? Yes. Get into position to turn around so we can escape. With almost zero visibility, over a hazardous surface strewn with huge boulders, the maneuver is only possible using scouts on foot. To your right, your right. They guide the huge trucks through a thorny ocean in order to avoid tire punctures at all costs. If they should get stuck here, the trucks would be in trouble. The fire is now in range of the cannons. It's time to attack. Finally cornered, the fire gives up. A decisive victory for firefighters. The fire's head is now defeated. The Logisson farm is out of danger. A long line of trucks now blocks any new fire from starting to the east and Cassis. The only path left for the fire is to the south, where it still consumes the pine forests. But the peaks here are rocky and the flames have little fuel to regain strength. Trapped in two limestone cirques, the fire is dying. This strategy envisaged by the fire department four months earlier works wonders. The beast is on its knees. The men are exhausted and happy. Is 
That's a lot of layers. It's heavy. I got a million missed calls. In this area and around Cassis, what we did with the heavy trucks was successful because we managed to stop the spread of fire. We took an initiative and used the location to take advantage of our cannons. That's how we managed to stop that fire. Everybody worked really well. The guys were cautious, even if sometimes it was a bit difficult. And there were no material damages. That's the cherry on top. No human damages, no material damages. The bosses will be happy and we won't have to write a report. It was intense, but the effectiveness of the heavy trucks is impressive. It was hot, which is normal, and there's smoke too. But we were never in danger, so we could stop it effectively. Now we're in the flooding phase. We'll see how it goes. Manu? Manu? Yeah? You want water on you? Not on me, I just changed. You changed your pants too? Everything, Robert. You put on deodorant and changed your underwear? Didn't have any left, I'm going commando. Oh, damn. I'm burnt out. <laughs> What's still burning around us are small patches of green which didn't burn when the fire first came through. So we're not that worried about it. What's left is to see if it jumped to the other side, which I can't tell from here. The mission of Robert Mugelli's heavy truck group comes to an end. It's 10 p.m. Reinforcements have arrived from the Vaucluse. They'll be taking care of the tedious but essential phase of flooding all the hot spots in the area. Basically, we were held in this position on the plateau there and over there too until that truck you see here. We opened a path with the engines. Then we made the liaison between that advancing truck to the other trucks there. So from those trucks, you go 100 yards and you'll reach the guys from Group 3 Aubagne. So if you can hold this position and do a good flooding, it'd be great since the fire burns sporadically, there are still plenty of green patches around. We're going. Good luck and thank you. Thank you too. In the mobile HQ set up that evening, they're thinking about the actions to take to avoid any new fires starting up and prepare the next day. The only thing left is this red zone that'll be causing us problems all night. The main danger still comes from the wind. It will change direction in the night and could carry embers into areas that have not yet burned. That's the issue. You'll set up the command center for tomorrow. Okay, good night, gentlemen. The sun rises with the expected bad news. Fire has reignited, this time in the direction of Marseille. A million people in the path of the flames. It's absolutely crucial they keep this fire from regaining power. Fortunately, with the sunrise, the Canadairs have resumed their service. Ten drops and 60 tons of water later, the fire front moving towards Marseille is now under control. But higher up in the valleys of the Genest and Chalombron, numerous hotspots remain. Horace's thermal camera accurately locates these places where fire is dormant. They're all time bombs. Everywhere the troops are activated to cool them down, with water but also with fire retardant this purple liquid which prevents the plants from burning. In the valley of Cholombron at the foot of limestone cirques, the flames have already reappeared. Totally inaccessible, the new sources are growing. Only one team has the expertise for this type of operation in hostile environments, the DIH, Helicopter Intervention Unit. These elite troops are equipped and trained to work in the most inhospitable areas of the scrubland. Their secret weapon, their helicopter, which transports troops and equipment where conventional teams cannot access. At its makeshift heliport, Captain Denny Barges oversees the maneuver. First, we have to define the positions for our equipment. The water tank will go up there on the ridge. 
It may help us put out a new fire or provide refills for the helicopter. The mission for the men of the DIH is to flood the last areas that burned at the foot of the hills. For this, they have to transport 12 men, two pumps, and two water tanks. Working with a helicopter is expensive, and the men stationed in the valleys are very isolated. The team at the heliport mustn't forget anything. Wait, I'm missing an extension? Where did it go? Go get one from the CCF, fast. For Etienne, the pilot, the difficulty is maneuvering the largest water tank in the Armada. With a capacity of 800 gallons, it can continually supply an outpost and ensure the troops' security. But this 550-pound load in the heavy winds can easily destabilize the aircraft. Transporting it up to the site demands great expertise and intense concentration. Once the equipment is in place, the helicopter is equipped with its 200-gallon water bag. Now begins the many round trips to bring water to the hose brigade. The equipment and water are in position. All that's left is to transport the last team, including Robin. If the wind picks up again with the heat, the trees could start burning again. Up at the summit, many long hours of watering are needed to complete the flooding mission in this sector. The helicopter also provides an overall view of the disaster. In less than 12 hours, 1,000 acres of pine forest and scrubland went up in smoke the equivalent of 300 football fields. Scrubland gives way to a vast burn zone that will scar the landscape of the Kalonk National Park for many years to come. The fire was dealt with masterfully by the firefighters, but some improvements could have enabled them to limit its progression even more. For Vincent Philippe and Pastor Deltier, each fire leads to an analysis and proposals so that in the future, the firefighters can be even more effective. Here we have a good example of some installations that served us well, even if they are old. It's true that some installations deserve updating because they're about 10 years old. This area was worked on. There was a strategy in place with those who intervened on this fire. All of this helps to prevent damage. Unfortunately, this sector is not covered by lookout posts. We know our fight is won in the first minutes after an outbreak. We've suggested installing a lookout post in the national park to increase our chances of spotting fires. It caused a big debate. Is it really efficient? Isn't it going to spoil the landscape? And today I think we can see exactly what's spoiling the landscape. It's the fire that we detected too late. A new lookout post in the park may be the next tool for preventing future fires. For now, their worry is that the fire reignites. 72 hours after the flame's passage, after three days of good weather, new mistral gusts are announced. If any hotspots remain here, a new fire could reignite. To find hotspots without having to use Horus, 
the observation plane at a cost of 3,500 euros an hour, the firefighters have developed a new weapon, a compact tool packed with technology that allows one man to accurately map hotspots, the drone. At daybreak, Sergeant Lillian Gardas of the robotic reconnaissance team meets with Major Scalacci, chief for security in this zone. We were faced with a fire of unprecedented scale, of enormous power. Today, we're making sure that there are no hot spots left thanks to the drone's thermal camera. It sends information to the ground crews who will handle those hot spots. This is a gas engine, the same engine as in a lawnmower or a chainsaw. I'm checking all the mechanical parts to prevent any technical problems during the flight. The engine is coupled with a double rotor that turns six blades, three feet long, giving the drone over an hour and a half of autonomy, essential for covering hundreds of burnt anchors and inspecting remote areas. We need to cover this whole area because it's not accessible. We have to observe it with the thermal camera to make sure there are no hot spots left in these three zones. So once it takes off, it'll start making rounds. We'll post ourselves next to the VLTT. The blades rotate pretty quickly. The drone has a gyro-stabilized head that carries two cameras, one color with a very long zoom lens and the other an ultra-sensitive thermal camera. The hot spots look like this. On the car? These are hot spots after a fire, which can remain for two days. That car's been stopped for more than half an hour, so when there's a hot spot, it's clearly visible. Effective after fires, the drone also has other uses for aiding people in trouble. We've also used it to look for people, like stray hikers or missing persons that we hadn't heard from for some time. After 40 minutes of flight, the pilot sees an anomaly. What's that? There's something hot here, in the second little parking lot just behind the trees. A troublesome hotspot needs to be dealt with before the Mistral picks up. A team is dispatched to deal with the problem. Mission accomplished for the drone team. No hotspots remain in this burn zone. The coming Mistral is no longer a threat to the sector. It's mid-September and the vegetation is still extremely dry. Late season fires are still very possible. The firefighters are awaiting one thing, the rain, because only the rain can bring an end to this season. But the long awaited rainfall could also turn against them. During the fire season, 11,000 acres of nature zones went up in smoke. Wherever there was fire, massive amounts of ash litter the ground. If the rains are heavy, they can carry off everything in their path and generate devastating mud flows. This morning, a depression from the south is approaching. This air mass, loaded with rain, is about to fall on the landscapes of the Bouche de Rhone. The rain falling now on the burn zones begins carrying ash and plant debris. Streams form, quickly becoming raging torrents of mud. Fortunately, the storm did not drop enough water for the streams to reach the towns. And barrage systems lining the hills proved to be effective. 
Thanks to a multitude of mini dams, small lakes formed. The progression of the muddy streams was stopped. The heavy rains that just fell have put an end to the threat of new fires. Despite the 378 fires that started this year, there were no casualties, no civilians or firefighters killed. Eight firefighters were burned during the Chateau neuf les martigues fire on July 15th, but they all survived the experience. Despite these good results, the firefighters are always aware that their job exposes them to real dangers. Each year, a delegation pays tribute to two firefighters who died on the front line of a fire in 1989. The two firefighters were battling a fire in the town of Tretz when a plane dropped six tons of water on them, killing them instantly. 27 years later, I would like to say that once more, we're gathered here. We're gathered here to express all our compassion, our esteem and our friendship to the families of Gérard Di Martino and Majid Chabi in this painful moment. We can only be in admiration of what they did. We share your sadness. That's why we're all here today. We don't really know how it happened. The plane was coming straight towards us. I saw it go over me, flying very low, and it dropped its entire load. The water sprayed wider than expected, and the guys who were fighting the fire on the ground got hit. We've had deaths in the fight against wildfires, so we must show our support to the families who've lost their loved ones in the fires. The motto of the civilian firefighter is courage and dedication. This is not something that you simply feel. It's something you live every day. I don't think about courage and devotion. I do my job because I like it. It's my duty when I'm in uniform to help people in any way I can. If you choose this job, you do what must be done. That's the job. During this extremely difficult summer, the men and women firefighters of the Bouche de Rhone demonstrated their courage and skill. This was especially true for the young firefighters who'd never fought a large fire. Early in the season, everyone doubted their ability to face the flames. But they demonstrated more than just an ability to fight fires. They proved that they had what it takes to carry on with the firefighting tradition. On this day of Saint Barbe, Léa Pigua, Sébastien Courcoing, and Robin Schmitt will be rewarded for their commitment and dedication. You all receive the rank of firefighter first class. Leia is promoted to firefighter first class. Sébastien and Robin are promoted to the rank of sergeant. The challenging past four months gave these firefighters an experience that no training could ever provide. This season was a key step that has enabled them to grow. I made first-class firefighter. It's a recognition for my good work and my behavior, my regular shifts and loyalty. It's a reward for the past two years of work. It's an honor to receive this kind of decoration. After being in the back of trucks taking orders, I'll get more responsibility now. The hardest season of the decade also brought rewards to the general staff and the highest ranks. I would say that we had a difficult summer, but it went well. We learned a lot. I've been a firefighter for 30 years. It's been about 15 years since I saw a season like this. I'm passionate about fighting wildfires. I've become rusty, and at the end of that season, I'm an expert again. During the fires in the Calanque, I was at ease, even though there were a few difficult moments. I was more at ease than at the start of the season. It's a good thing the season's over, because we're all exhausted. We ended the season with the fire in the Calanque. We handled it well enough. There was no material or human accident, and that's the most important. But it had to stop. People were starting to crack. The volunteer firefighters had to handle their job as well as their shifts, and they did a lot. The professional firefighters didn't take their days off to join the fight. It had to stop. 
et qu'il fallait que ça s'arrête. I'm sure 2016 is a year benchmark in terms of wildfires and experience. I'm certain of it. This exceptional season also marks a turning point in the careers of many professional firefighters, among them Robert Mugelli. He who guided his men intelligently and courageously into the fires all summer will take on even more responsibility. He is appointed chief of the Oriol Rescue Center, a promotion ceremony that brings together all of the brigade's top brass and represents a new beginning for Lieutenant Mugelli. Ladies and gentlemen, you can be proud of your firefighters in Oriol. They fought on the front line. And if someone today can claim some victories because this war is over, it's you, Robert. Because you led the truck to the top of the Ginest and you stopped the fire. I think you deserve to be applauded. Officers, non-commissioned officers, corporals and firefighters. Your new chief is now Lieutenant Mugelli. Attention. Thank you all. At ease. Where do I go? <laughs> you don't have to touch me. And just like Lieutenant Robert Mugelli, the entire fire brigade grew and evolved this summer. Yet, though there were no human casualties, this season of forest fires saw vast areas of pine forest and scrubland go up in flames and smoke, as well as 25 houses, a restaurant, and a high school. 4.6 million euros were spent to fight the fires and save the houses. and more than 13,000 firefighters battled the flames. But above all, it's Mother Nature who paid the heaviest price to the flames. More than 12,000 acres of nature areas were destroyed. Plants, but also animals, were swept up by the flames. The Mediterranean forests will recover, but it will take years decades. This season of forest fires will long be remembered and will remember the intelligence, the bravery, the expertise of those who fought the battles, the soldiers of fire.